We've talked about Dirichlet convolution as an operator on arithmetic functions, so now we're going to talk about finding inverses with respect to that operation. Now remember, the function epsilon of n is given by this formula. Epsilon of 1 is equal to 1, and epsilon of anything larger is equal to 0. It's also the identity element for the Dirichlet convolution operation. The convolution of epsilon with any arithmetic function f is just that same function f. We established this in the previous video. Now when we have identity elements for operations, we generally want to be able to find inverses. Given an arithmetic function f, can we find another arithmetic function g so that the convolution is this identity element epsilon? If we can, then by commutativity, the convolution of g and f is the same as the convolution of f and g, which would therefore also be epsilon. If such a g can be found, we're going to call it the Dirichlet inverse of the function f and denote it as f inverse. Now I want to be clear, f inverse here, this, this is not an exponent of minus 1. We're not talking about 1 over f. That would be the inverse function with respect to the multiplication operation. But we're also not talking about the inverse with respect to the composition operation, which also tends to get denoted as f inverse. Convolution is going to be the predominant operation on functions in this sort of unit of the course. So remember, we mean the inverse with respect to Dirichlet convolution. Well, that's all well and good, but how do I even know inverse functions exist? So here's a theorem. For any arithmetic function f, the Dirichlet inverse function exists if and only if f of 1 is not 0. We're just going to compute the values of this inverse function one by one. First off, let's try to compute what the value of f inverse of 1 would have to be. Well, if f inverse is in fact the Dirichlet inverse of f, then this convolution is the epsilon function, and epsilon of 1 is 1. So whatever f inverse is, this convolution, if I plug 1 into it, I have to get out 1. On the other hand, this is a Dirichlet convolution, so I've input a number, I look for all the positive factors of that number with their corresponding cofactors, I plug 1 into one of the functions, the other into the other, take products, and sum up all the remaining terms. But the only positive factor of 1 to find is 1 itself with cofactor 1. So in that sum, the only term that shows up is this right here. So both of these things are equal to the Dirichlet convolution of these two functions with one input. Therefore, these two things are equal to each other. And thus, f inverse of 1 has to be 1 over f of 1. But if f of 1 is 0, that's not a number. So if f of 1 is equal to 0, f inverse of 1 cannot actually take any value at all, and therefore that inverse function can't exist. Now let's suppose f of 1 isn't 0. Now we have to show that there is an inverse function, and what we're going to do is simply find one by one what value the inverse function takes for each input. Well, we've already established that f inverse of 1 had better be 1 over f of 1. Let's take a look at 2. On the one hand, if these are in fact inverse functions, then this convolution is the epsilon function, but epsilon of 2 is 0. Remember, the epsilon function satisfies epsilon of 1 is 1, but epsilon of anything else is 0. So epsilon of 2 is 0. On the other hand, let's just work through the Dirichlet convolution here. What are the positive factors of 2, just 1 and 2? So I get this term by plugging 1 and its cofactor in this order, and then in this term I get the other choice. I then have to sum these up. Now f inverse of 1 was already computed to be 1 over f of 1, and this term here I haven't changed. But all of this has to equal epsilon of 2, which is 0. Therefore, we can solve for f inverse of 2. The value it must take is negative f of 2 over f of 1 squared. And again, we've assumed f of 1 is non-zero, so this is just some number, and I can assign f inverse to take this value if you plug in 2. So using the fact that the convolution of the function and its inverse must be the epsilon function, the first thing we did was find if this inverse exists, f inverse of 1 has to be this number. f inverse of 2 has to be this number here. Now what we're going to assume is that we've computed the values for f inverse of k for k going 1, 2, all the way up to n. Now the convolution of f inverse and f has to be the epsilon function, but epsilon of any number bigger than 1 is going to spit out a 0. So the convolution of f with uh, f inverse, if you plug in n plus 1, it has to spit out 0. But if I apply the definition of Dirichlet convolution, we get that 0, in other words epsilon of n plus 1, must be 
the sum over all the positive factors of n plus 1, plugging the factors into f inverse and the cofactors into f. But our assumption was, I know the value of f inverse of k for all the numbers up to n. That covers f inverse of lots of these divisors. Okay, so for example, if n plus 1 is equal to 10, its divisors are 1, 2, 5, and 10, but 1, 2, and 5 would all be smaller numbers than 10, and I would know what value to put here. Here I just have the function f, and the presumption is this is just some function that takes values. So many of these terms are numbers, and these are numbers. In fact, the only term that isn't known is if I chose the factor n plus 1. I know how f inverse acts on all the numbers up to n, but I don't yet know how it acts on the number n plus 1. So the only term that I don't know the value of in this enormous sum is f inverse of n plus 1. Therefore, you can just solve for it. Okay? You can isolate what f inverse of n plus 1 has to be in terms of all the previous values you've computed. So if you know the values 1 through n for f inverse, you can find what the value of f inverse of n plus 1 must be. Proceeding in this manner, you can declare the value of f inverse on all inputs. And therefore, on the initial assumption that f of 1 is non-zero, we found that f inverse does actually exist through a pretty tedious method of declaring what value it must take for every input. So this is a somewhat obvious looking result. For any arithmetic function f, where f of 1 is not 0, the inverse of the inverse is the original function. Many people would consider this pretty obvious, but it's worth actually proving it, although it is pretty fast. So for easiness of notation, let's just say that g is the same thing as f inverse. This just makes not as many exponents floating around. Well, the convolution of f with g is the epsilon function, since they're inverses of one another. Therefore, f is g inverse, because it's a function that when I do Dirichlet convolution with g, the result is the identity function epsilon. So f is the inverse of g, which if I just resubstitute g as f inverse, I get f is f inverse inverse. It's not a very long result to prove, but we are going to be using it as a step in the next slide. So I just figured, heck, let's go ahead and state that as a theorem and quickly prove it. Now we'd like to take a look at how multiplicativity of functions interacts with this notion of Dirichlet inverses. So the theorem we're going to prove next is that for any arithmetic function f, the Dirichlet inverse f inverse is multiplicative if and only if the original function was multiplicative. So first, let's suppose f is multiplicative and not constantly 0. Then f of 1 is 1, because this is a property of any multiplicative function that isn't constantly 0. And 1 is not equal to 0, so if f of 1 is not equal to 0, f inverse at least exists. What we need to show is that f inverse is multiplicative. So temporarily, we're going to define a new function g. g is this new function that we're declaring must be multiplicative, and therefore I only need to define how it acts on prime powers. And on prime powers, I'm going to say it does the same thing as f inverse. So g does the same as f inverse on prime powers, and g is multiplicative. We just don't know if f is. Okay? So we've taken the value that f inverse does on all prime powers and used it to create a new function g, which we then declared must be multiplicative with these as its prime power values. If we can show that the convolution of f with g is always the epsilon function, then g actually is f inverse. They'd be the same thing. So let's show that convolution is the epsilon function. Now f and g are both multiplicative, which means the Dirichlet convolution is as well. f was assumed to be multiplicative, remember, and g, we declared, is a multiplicative function that takes the values of f inverse as long as we're only plugging in prime powers. So therefore, g is multiplicative and so is f, so is the Dirichlet convolution, so let's just go ahead and hack through. Now since f star g is a multiplicative function, I'm hoping that it's the epsilon function, but it's at least multiplicative, which means all I need to do is see what it does to prime power inputs. Here's the definition of Dirichlet convolution, and for a prime power, the positive factors are quite easy to list out. It's p to the 0, p to the 1st, all the way to p to the k. In which case, I can write the sum like this. I just go for um, the exponent ranging from 0 to k, and my factor is p to the 0, uh, p to the i. 
But now, what numbers am I plugging into G? I am only plugging in a prime power. And G is the same as F as long as we're only looking at prime powers. So in fact, this Dirichlet convolution is multiplicative, so I only need to know how it acts on prime powers. As long as I'm only plugging a prime power into G, it's the same as F inverse. But now this right here would be exactly this Dirichlet convolution. And I know that F convolved with its inverse is the epsilon function. So for any prime power, F star G is the same as epsilon. And since F star G is multiplicative, this tells me how this function acts on every number. So for every input, F star G is the same as epsilon, meaning G is actually F inverse. And G was declared to be multiplicative back here. So assuming F is multiplicative, here is its inverse function and it's also multiplicative. The other direction is actually so immediate as to not even be written down. If F and F inverse, I'm sorry, if F inverse is multiplicative, f is just f inverse inverse. So this argument already tells me that if f inverse is multiplicative, its inverse would also be, and that would be f itself. So this works both ways. A function is multiplicative if and only if its Dirichlet inverse is also multiplicative. Now let's work through an example of finding a Dirichlet inverse. Define the function 1 of n to be the constantly 1 function. That's just always equal to 1. We claim the Dirichlet inverse of this function is the Mobius function mu. Well, the, the one function is definitely multiplicative and therefore its inverse is as well. So we're just gonna denote the inverse of the one function by f. We want to show that f is the same as mu. Now on the one hand, if I plug in one, this convolution is the epsilon function because these are inverses of one another, and epsilon of one is one. On the other hand, if I simply compute the convolution, I would just get this single term. Now this function always spits out one. It's gonna make a lot of our computations easier. So this is just f of one. So one is equal to this convolution, which is equal to f of one, so f of one is one. Of course, one is also mu of one. So at least I want to show f is mu in general, but if I plug in one, they're equal there at least. So, so far so good. Just by testing the value of one, I haven't violated my claim. But f is a multiplicative function. Mu is also a multiplicative function. Okay, so if I can show that f and mu agree on all prime powers, then they must be the same function. But let's start just by plugging in a prime. Okay, so epsilon of any prime number is zero. Remember, epsilon of anything other than one is zero. So on the one hand, epsilon of a prime is zero, but the epsilon function is this convolution because f is the inverse of the one function. The Dirichlet convolution here is pretty easy to check because p only has two positive factors, one and p itself. So this is all I'd get. The one function is always one, so the sum reduces to just one plus f of p. So zero, must equal one plus f of p. In other words, f of p is negative one, which is the same thing as mu of a prime. So if I plug in one, f and mu agree. If I plug in a prime, f and mu agree. But as I stated already, they're both multiplicative. So if they agree on all prime powers, we're done. So now let's just check powers two and larger. So we claim for any power of a prime where the exponent is two or larger, f of p to the k will be the same thing as mu of p to the k. Therefore, f and mu agree on all prime powers, and since they're both multiplicative, they are in fact the same function. Now for k equals two, okay, we're gonna prove this inductively. Our base case is that k equals two. Epsilon of p squared must be zero. This Dirichlet convolution can be computed pretty directly because the positive factors of prime squared are easy to list out. They are one, the prime, and the prime squared. Now, the one function is always one, so I get f of p squared plus f of p plus one. f of p was negative one and f of one was one. So overall, zero is equal to this. These cancel and we get f of p squared must be zero. That matches our desired claim. We want f of all prime powers larger than or equal to two to be zero. Our base case is now established. The second power of any prime, f of p squared equals zero. Now let's inductively assume that f of p squared through f of p to the k are all equal to zero. Now if I look at epsilon of p to the k plus one, that's definitely zero. Epsilon is this Dirichlet convolution because they're inverses of one another. 
The positive factors of p to the k plus 1 can be listed out pretty directly. They are 1 and p all the way up to p to the k and p to the k plus 1. Okay, the 1 function kind of vanishes because it's 1 all the time. We have assumed that f of p to the k all the way down to f of p squared are all 0, so those all vanish. The only terms that remain are f of p and f of 1, which we computed to be negative 1 and 1, and the same thing happens. All of this cancels and we get 0 equals f of p to the k. So what we have shown is that the Dirichlet inverse of the 1 function has to be multiplicative, and on all prime powers, it, it matches the value of the Mobius function, another multiplicative function, therefore they're the same function. So the Dirichlet inverse of the 1 function is in fact the Mobius function. A fairly straightforward computation, but we're going to see later on in this uh, section that it has some pretty important implications. So let's talk about what we've done. The previous example gives a pretty good strategy for computing Dirichlet inverses specifically of multiplicative functions. Assuming the multiplicative function that you start with has a formula that you can apply to prime powers and you can work with fairly uh, readily, you simply use that formula and some sort of inductive procedure to keep seeing what f inverse has to do on prime powers. The convolution of f with f inverse has to be the epsilon function, epsilon of prime powers has to be zero. Dirichlet convolution requires you to list out a bunch of positive factors, but factors of prime powers are easy to list out and you can just sort of inductively figure out what f inverse has to do on all prime powers, and since it's multiplicative, that's all you need to do. But what if the original function wasn't multiplicative? So for example, if f of n is n plus 1, can you compute the Dirichlet inverse to this? Well, this is not a multiplicative function, so you cannot just restrict yourself to prime powers. You have to follow that procedure we did to show that Dirichlet inverses exist at all. You start by saying f inverse of 1 is 1 over f of 1, and then you proceed single number by single number using the definition that f can um, Dirichlet convolved with its inverse as the epsilon function and the assumption that you know all the previous values, you work through the Dirichlet convolution, etc. And since you inductively know all the lower values of f inverse with only this last term unknown, you can solve for this last term, but it's kind of a pain and it's a very unpleasant procedure to do in general. So in general, we're not really going to be trying to find a nice formula when we apply this procedure. It usually won't happen that way. You would just compute values one at a time until you run out of patience. For multiplicative functions, however, if there is a formula that pops out for prime powers, you might expect the same thing to happen for the Dirichlet inverse because you can, you can restrict yourself to only looking at prime powers. For non-multiplicative functions, it's a very tedious task to determine Dirichlet inverse functions.